top. Um, it's being recorded, I forgot to mention that. Um, we're gonna share this either with the group of people who are here now or more widely. Um, so if that's a problem for you, please shout up or keep yourself muted and off camera if you don't want to be on the recording. Um, and yes, without further ado, I will hand over. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah, so um, thanks for coming along. Apologies if my laptop makes any weird noise. I often find that it's a little bit too loud, but otherwise, let's get started. Um, my name is Andres Varadi. Dr. Richard Wood, who is my co-presenter, should be along at some point. He's currently in a meeting, so please um, excuse him. He's very busy. Um, but yeah, thank you for the introduction, Chris. Um, as Chris has already gone through it, the PHM Explorer is basically an open source suite of tools that we basically designed and started in 2020 to develop to try and get some system engagement for population health management in our system um, to try and get data a little bit more available to any clinician or GP with a general interest. Uh, we do want to um, thank the Health Foundation for their support in actually funding this project and for generally helping us advance PHM here in the Southwest. Um, I do want to just really briefly give a shout out to that. Um, everyone who has received an RStudio Cloud link. Um, there will, first of all, I'm going to start with some slides, uh, but later there will be an interactive section. There will be an interactive section of this session. So if you if you head to the RStudio Cloud link, um, please just launch a new RStudio project, and then in the bottom right corner, navigate the files and then select app.r to actually run the program. Um, I will show this myself later. Um, but just in case someone wants to, if if there are people who want to click along and haven't done so, this is what we'll be looking at. So ge the general schedule for today is going to be that I'm going to spend around 15 to 20 minutes on slides just to give a brief introduction and some wider context on why we're doing what we're doing. And then I'm going to spend about an hour and 40 minutes running on what the program itself does um, and the various tools that we have in there hopefully holding a break around 11 o'clock just to give everyone a chance to either think of some questions or, or grab themselves a cup of tea. I'm not going to really talk a lot about what PHM is. Um, I'm, I'm sh I hope that everyone in the room is already familiar with it. If, if not, um, there are many different definitions, but generally speaking, most people can agree on that PHM focuses on looking on PHM essentially relies on having a system-wide data set or, or some linked data where you have a lot of individuals, and then you can use that data to identify a particular group or cohort of individuals whose outcomes uh, you can then actually focus on either by changing the way that you're working or by putting in a particular intervention to target those individuals to try and either reduce the cost that they are incurring or to generally improve their health outcomes. Um, there are a couple of, um, yeah, there are a lot of factors that actually go into population health management, prime, including the fact that um, some, some new, new York studies have shown that only around 20% of health, health, health outcomes are actually dependent on having access to good quality health care, and the remaining 80% come from other wider determinants. Um, for, exam, for example, access, access to green spaces, etc. As there are a couple of challenges when it actually comes to either developing your own software or in general, just trying to embed population health management in healthcare. Um, as I've already mentioned, the availability of, of good quality linked data is, is very important um, as, as almost everything that we do is based on data. Uh, but you also need to have the technical capability to actually design and then develop your solution and you really need to understand what question that you are trying to, to solve as we found that whenever there's a misunderstanding or, or a miscommunication it can quite often mean that the that well a, a couple of days of work can essentially not quite quite help solve the problem that we're looking at if the origin question wasn't defined clearly enough. Uh, so we've really tried to put a bit of a focus on making sure that the Explorer was customizable um, for our in-house 
for our in-house data visualization, we really wanted to make sure that any clinician or GP who actually spent just a little bit of time familiarizing themselves with how it works would be able to access data and then uh, well, would be able to access the tool and then through that access the system by data set that would normally not be available to them. Um, as the general process is that they submit a work request and then the BI team has to actually spend time working through it. And we just kind of thought that this would be a really good, good way of getting them to cut out the middleman and just really quickly answer a question that they might have. Uh, the PHM XLR is open source, and if there is anyone who would be interested in downloading it, um, it can be found on our GitHub, the link to which I will be sharing at the very end of the workshop. The four main functions that we wanted to include in the uh, kind of around PHM um, was generally just a, a simple summary of our population demographics, of just what our population looks like. We also wanted to do some a bit more advanced, I suppose, segmentation um, of how we define our various population groups, as well as risk stratification and visualizing what pathways our patients actually take and how they interact with the system in its entirety rather than as just separate services. So um, it seems that we're doing all right for time. So I did once again just want to um, jump back to the schedule. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the data um, and, and what our system-wide data set looks like um, here in the BNSSG ICB um, and just how that works when it comes to the Explorer. And then I'm going to go and actually get started with the interactive um, workshop that everyone else can, will be able to join in. So as I'm, as I'm as I mentioned, the data is based. The data that the Explorer uses is based on our system by data set. Um, the main idea behind which is that there are two tables that are linked by patient attributes, that are linked by patient ID. One of which is the attributes, and the other is the activity. Um, the attributes table um, essentially has a row for each patient. So the attributes table that I have working with the that I that will be working with today has ten thousand rows of synthetic synthetic patients in it, and each row just contains some some attribute about the patient, whether which could be their age, the deprivation of the area that they live in, um, as well as any clinical clinical conditions that they may have. So you can see that I've got coronary heart disease here on the right side. This is all of our clinical conditions are recorded as zeros and ones, where one means that the patient has the attributes, which just makes it much simpler to sum up when it comes to calculating multimorbidity and other indices. Uh, the minimum viable kind of data requirements that we've set up for this is obviously the patient ID, as well as just the sex, age, ethnicity, uh, some form of deprivation, which could be the index of multiple deprivation or anything that you'd like to include as well as some geographical fields and clinical conditions about the patients. The activity table um, has more rows than the attributes table. And here each row just represents a point of interaction between the patient and the system. Uh, so th this interaction could be something like being admitted to A&D, making a 111 call, visiting that GP. Uh, really, it's, it's any point in the system where the patient actually meets face-to-face -face with the healthcare system. Um, obviously, these link via patient IDs to the attribute table. Uh, and, the, and the kind of the way that these, the, the way that this table looks like is that you have some points of delivery or pod columns, which are basically just character vectors that categorize the activity types. Um, so this could be something like the first column could be secondary care, and then a second column might be that you actually explain what type of secondary care it is, um, A and D, um, an active operation, etc. And then we also need the arrival, departure date, specialty, and the cost, which we can then later aggregate to, to some more number crunching. This just about concludes the data section of this. So I'm going to pause here just for a minute to see if anyone has any urgent questions. And then I'm going to um, move on with the actual workshop. So if, if anyone has any questions, please do just drop them into chat and I will do my best to answer them. Um, I have a raised hand, if I see correctly. 
Um, sorry for being so slow. I'm afraid I'm not used to Zoom in general. So please do excuse that. I thought I had a hand raised. Hi, yes, yeah, sorry. Hi, Chris Maney. Um, it was a, just a quick question um, about... Um, so is the assumptions of the model cross-sectional or longitudinal? Because you one of your tables had a cross-sectional take on what conditions a patient has, um, whereas the other has dates in it. So presumably if you're doing some sort of network type model, you may have things bouncing through through time, but something like uh, pregnancy, like you had in one of those areas, obviously a time-related condition because they're only pregnant for a certain time. Yeah, so um, generally speaking, uh, we found that the complexity of doing, doing any working with time series data, we find the complexity to be a little bit beyond what we envisioned, it to be too complex compared to what we could do. So at the moment, so the general setup was that we would just take an attribute slice, mm -hmm. um, which would kind of be for a given time period. And then the attributes uh, and then the activity you could include as historical data to give some context of how the patient yeah. arrived at this point. But um, really it's, it's just focused on the on, on the on the time period from when the, the, this attributes table is from yeah that makes um, a lot of sense yeah thanks yeah we, we've generally found out that, that um including about 12 months of uh historical activity data is is useful when it comes to actually working with current health conditions or or costs for predicting um and the attendances uh but yeah there's there's not that much in terms of longitudinal um, analysis that's done does that answer your question? Yeah, that, that's fantastic. Thanks. Yeah, it, it adds so much more complexity to put the longitudinal thing in. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah thank you. Yeah. Um, brilliant. Yeah. So um, let's move on to the actual interactive part of the workshop, unless someone else would like to drop in. Um, hopefully, um, you've all got the link. It was put into the meeting chat. Uh, assuming that you have an account for the, assuming that you really quickly register for the Posit Cloud, the way that you can actually access the program is that when you log in, you should see um, your workspace rather similar to this. You this you probably won't have anything here, but all you will want to do is click on new project here in the top right corner, then click new R Studio project. Um, once you've done this, you then may need to wait about half a minute just while um the cloud clones the program for you which which can be a little bit awkward when you have to pause um but otherwise this will just basically copy all of the files that i'm going to use so that you can use them in the same way um i hope that some of you are familiar with r if not all you will have to do is just here in the top bottom right corner you will want to find app.r which is the main file that actually runs the explorer so what all you want to do is you'll want to go into the nhsr 2020 folder you will then want to go into the phm explorer folder and then you will want to click on app.r and then once you've opened app.r um, you should see something change on your screen. And then if you just click run app, it should hopefully throw up a window. Um, now, if your browser is configured to, bo bo to block pop-ups, um, which I think that most browsers do by default, somewhere here at the top, you may get a message saying that it's bo blocked a pop-up. You may need to just click around a little bit to allow it. So for me, pop-ups and redirects are temporarily allowed just on this page so that I can get on with things. You may also need to do the same thing. Um, I'm going to have to pause here for a moment because I've been advised that this is where the most technical problems appear. So if if someone is trying to trying to click, if someone if someone would like to click along and is having trouble getting to this point, uh, please do do let me know. Um, we do have someone here to help us out with any technical difficulties that we may come across. How do you mean trying to remove the block? So when I did it, I got a message from somewhere up here in my, around my main bar that said that my that the my browser blocked a 
blocked a pop-up. Um, some of, uh, depending on what browser you use, I think this will be slightly different. Um, Chris, if I could ask you to potentially jump in here. So for me here, I can, if I click this button here to the left of my, so I'm currently running Edge. If I click this button here, it will, it, it has a section on pop-ups that I can just change. Um, you, you may want to just hover over some of these options and just see what you have available um, for you. So some, um, I, I do have a message no, that's just saying that if that you can do the same in Chrome is that you just click the padlock and then you just click allow. Oh yeah, yeah, looks like we're done. Is everyone else all right? We'll shout up in the chat if you're not, but it looks like everyone's okay. Okay, thank you. So um, we're almost at the part where everyone else can follow along. Um, the final thing that I'm going to really do is just show you how the data is loaded in the Explorer. So I'm hoping that everyone has managed to get to this page. This is just kind of the landing page. What it really does is it tells you um, that you've got some number of people, um, 10,000 in this case. You've got, they've got some number of activities. In this case, we've got 520,000. And then you can click some buttons that I'm not going to describe just yet. Um, but essentially, this is from this point on, you can actually just start with your analysis. Um, as I mentioned, the first thing, so if you wanted to use your own data set, um, the general thing that you would do would be to click on upload files. Uh, you would then select the data sets that you should have. Um, this part you cannot follow because I have not included. Um, um, these files with the extra files, um, but I'm just going to show for the sake of argument what it looks like when you actually load it. Um, while this loads, I have a raised hand. Um, someone says that some people are getting a gray, a blank gray play, gray page. Yeah, I can't, is... I can't see anything in the picture. Iris, but I'm Felix. I can't see anything in the page. It's just blank gray. Uh, so I. So just to double check, have you managed to um, open the file the as the same as what I described here? Yes. So it's the PM Explorer uh, file uh, file and page. So the pop up page is, is coming I blank. See. I see. Well, I'm not really sure. Um, Chris, I'm not sure if you've had any shiny applications happen. Um, Um, I'm not sure how many shiny applications you have. Is this something that's happened before? Um, can I also just ask, is there anyone who has managed to actually load in? I'm getting a lot of, a lot of messages saying that people haven't been able to. Yeah, I have. Managed. Thank you. Um, in that case, could I ask you to just stop the program? Um, let's, do, let's do a restart. So just click on this red button here, um, back in your browser if you can, and then just click uh, run app again. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if restart will help, but it might. <clears throat> has, has that helped anyone? Um, or, are, or are the same issues being maintained? Same, it's same for me. Still no text. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure what I can suggest to this. Um, Chris, are you still here? Yeah, I'm just trying to replicate it on mine. So yeah, mine you... looks okay. What browser are people who are struggling using? Edge, yeah. Uh, mine is Edge. Edge and Chrome. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm currently running on Edge. Um, are you on the, the a, a corporate, are you behind a corporate firewall? Are you at work? Yeah, it's the NHS laptop, yeah. And you're, you're not on, you're not on a VPN at home, you're at work? No, I'm at home. 
Yeah. Are you on the VPN? Yeah, I'm on a VPN. It might help if those who can, if you can come off the VPN, I, I'm surprised you got this far, to be honest, because I thought it blocked earlier than this. But it might be the case that if you are at home and you're on a corporate VPN, if you come off it, that might help. Okay. Oh, look, there you go. Yeah, someone. Yeah, someone... I'm, I'm currently going through the messages as well. So for anyone who's not currently reading chat, um, someone has managed to get in by coming off the VPN and then allowing pop-up, pop-ups in Edge. Thank you, Adam. Um, some people are finding that their VPN works fine, so obviously that's good, but not quite. Depends well. how your firewalls configured. Does it? This is a bit of a, it's a bit potluck, really. I think to be yeah. honest, if you're stuck on if you're stuck at work or something, I I think it probably will not work. I'm afraid. I don't think there's anything we can do. We do have this problem sometimes. Um, yes, if you could find some internet connection that's not, you might have like a public Wi-Fi connection if you work in a hospital, for example. If you could find something that's not behind a corporate firewall, then you might find that it works. But other than that. Um, I, I, I don't think it's going to work. Your best bet then is probably to clone the code, I would think, and then if you've got RStudio on your computer, you could run it that way. Mm. Right, so I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but I think that if you just click on in the bottom right corner um, where you have your little internet icon, if you click on that and then you click disconnect from your VPN, that might have, it sounds like some people have 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 found that um turning the vpn off works um not sure if you can confirm chris that this is a way to go about it it is yeah it's just obviously if you're at work there is there's, there, there is no other internet connection other than one from behind a firewall as i say unless you can find something public what sometimes i mean in my building at work we've got public wi-fi so you could you could potentially use that but if you've only got a corporate connection and it doesn't work and you're at work then i'm afraid it's not going to work you can clone the code off GitHub, I'll put a link in the chat and run it that way. Um, but other than that, I think you're a bit stuck, I'm afraid. We do mm. have this problem sometimes. Oh yeah, hotspot onto phone is good too, yeah, that's true. Uh, I'm just wondering if you can still remain on the internet, just turn the um, VPN itself off in your when you click on your connections. But yeah, I would say, I mean, in the interest of time, I think probably people who, who, who are stuck, if you go to the, to the GitHub repository, click the, the big green code button, download the zip. If you unpack the code, you, can, you should be able to run it straight from there. There shouldn't be any difference, I don't think, between the two. It should be identical. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, the only thing that may be different is that you would need to include, you might need to in install some more packages before you can click it. Oh, yes, that's true. You would need to install um, and and yeah, I mean, I mean, um, yeah. So okay, so for anyone who is um, who who wants to run it from GitHub, um, I will just say that the same thing is that the GitHub is a little bit chaotic. All you will want to do is once again just find the NHSR twenty twenty two and then run the version from there because that's the one that's got the latest data update in it. Um. Otherwise, I think that in the interest of time, we are going to move on. If there is anyone who is struggling, then um, if you could just let, if, if maybe with Chris, you could try and, and try, some, maybe just talk to each other in the chat or something. Yeah, if anybody um, wants I to, to, yeah, going to send me a message, on. then feel free. I can, I can try and help from here, yeah. Thank you, Chris. Okay. 
works fine locally, but you get error messages about the versions of icons in font also, but it doesn't stop running. Right. Um, so um, Chris main as long as it's running, I think I'm just going to carry on. Sorry for any inconvenience, but um, yeah, I'm going to have to re re restart because it timed out. But yeah, so um, hopefully everyone has managed to get, get themselves, or at least most people have managed to get themselves to this landing page. Um, I do apologize to anyone that hasn't, but I'm, as I said, I'm, I think I'm conscious of time and we're going to have to move on. So the data that I described earlier essentially can be uploaded by using this top half. Um, it's already preloaded, so you don't have to do anything at the moment. All you really have to do is click some is click here, upload the files, and then on the in the subsequent pages, just select the minimum data minimum data fields that I outlined earlier. So you just have to tell the program um, which field contains um, the sex, the, the deprivation, the age, as well as the clinical as well as the clinical conditions, and then it will just aggregate some aggregate the data, and then it will just land you back here, basically unchanged on this page. Uh, we're not going to do that because we don't have time. Um, but there is synthetic data that is also uh, um, on our GitHub that if you do want to try it on your own, I, I suppose you could. So um, as I briefly described earlier, um, there is a good chunk of PHM that revolves around uh, identifying a segment of your population or a cohort or some group. Um, that you are especially interested in, um, and then you just want to do some analysis on them. Uh, for the sake of argument, we've called this the analysis data set in our program, just because we needed uh, a good name and we already use segmentation elsewhere. So at the moment, the, the default option is that you just use everyone, which is your population data set. So let's try to add a new smaller group that we might be interested in working with. To add one, you just click this button here, the add new analysis data set button, and then it takes you to a page that where you can essentially define rules based on which patients will be included. So let's suppose that for the sake of argument, I really just wanted to remove some missing data because my data isn't perfect. So you can see that when the first field that I have is sex at birth, and you can see that I've got three options for it. I've got female, male, and not specified. Let's, so let's suppose that I just untick not specified because I don't want these patients. Um, and let's also suppose that I wanted to remove all patients who had myth, missing or unknown ethnicity values. Um, so in this case, I'm going to click add new rule. This then adds my rule number two. Here, I select my ethnicity. I, the, I then just use the default option of multiple choice select because I'm selecting characters. And then I'm just going to tick all of the boxes that I'm interested in. This will basically tell my program that for rule number one, I want everyone who is either, who, whose sex at birth value is either female or male, i.e. it will include everyone that's not specified or missing. And then it, it does something fairly similar for ethnicity. It just it uses different values. I'm going to name this data set something a little bit more sensible. I'm going to call it non-missing, um, just so that I will recognize it later. And then down here, I'm going to specify that I wanted to use rules one and two. This is basically just a logic statement that's that tells me how it how I want to join together the rules. And then when I click Get Analysis Dataset, it'll tell me that it has found 7,500 odd individuals out of the 10,000 who meet this criteria. So this is everyone who is not unspecified or unknown when it comes to their ethnicity and their sex. Uh, if, if you would like to know more information, every single page has some help options here on the right-hand side or maybe on the page itself. Um, generally, when you click these, you will just get a pop-up that tells you a little bit more about how this page works. Um, just, I'll mention this again later. Um, here at the bottom, you can see that I now have a new analysis data set. And when I return to my landing page, you can see that it's by default selected my new data set that I've just defined. But this one, this one has 7,500 individuals, whereas my entire population has 10,000. So I'm going to use this for all of the analysis that I'm going to do just because I defined it. And once I've selected it, I can just click go to actually load into the program itself. 
Hopefully that's all clear. This is all it says that really done is that it's taken my 10,000 starting individuals and it's filtered it to a smaller group of seven and a half thousand that I that I can then work with who meet some arbitrary criteria that I just came up with. So you can see that this is now my analysis data set. And this has now loaded into every single page and I can just click on any of these if I want to get started. So as I, as I mentioned, the general structure for the Explorer is that you've got your navigation bar here on the left-hand side. Uh, you've got some headers that just tell you, you know, what page you're on, what, what dates your activity range is over. In the center, you've got whatever the main body of the page is. In this case, it's just navigation and some options for editing the fields. And then on the right-hand side, you will have a help box that, that will just give you a little bit more info about whatever is on the page. Generally, um, I'm just going to briefly mention that these global groups are just the name that we came up with again. These are essentially just a collection of variables that we think of are very often mentioned when it comes to um, population health management or PHM. Uh, these are pro pre present on almost every single page so that we can refer to them. We can also add to these. So at the moment, you can see that I've got seven variables in here. I've got multimorbidity, deprivation, um, age bands, localities, ethnicity, um, bridges to our segments and some wider determinants. But if I wanted to, I could just add um, pretty much any other field to this that I wanted from the list of clinical conditions that I have in my data or from some of my wider determinants. The Explorer was designed to be nonlinear, so really um, there's no particular order to, to these tabs on the left, but I am still just going to go from top to bottom for the sake of convenience. Uh, but really, if you wanted to, but if but when someone actually does use it, you can just jump away, jump ahead to whichever section you are interested in. So the first thing that I'm going to again talk about is once again data because everybody loves it, which is the court identification page, which essentially just lets us edit the data, edit the data in a slightly different way to what we did back on the landing page when we added our analysis data set. All this really does is it allows us to add new fields to our already existing data. So if I, for a really simple argument would be to essentially just select everyone who is male in the population and then and then add that as a new field. So if I if I just really quickly click get cohort, it'll tell me that about half the population, half of my population belongs to this category. The idea being is that you can use this page to define fairly complicated rules if you want to compare two halves of your defined analysis data set against each other in terms of um, costs or, or general health. Um, once again, it's it's really it's really similar to what we did. I can just include a series of rules and then I can join them together as I want, and then it will just add a new field. So if I were to go back to navigation and then I were to click on my global groups now, you can see that it's added the new field that I've made. So the, so I'm just once again highlighting that this set of variables will be vis visible on every page. So I can change. So in the theme of flexibility, I can essentially just change what I want to visualize by editing this set. Um, I am going to, again, pause um, and double check on whether people have had any luck on following me or whether they've had any questions that they've come up with in the last 10 minutes. So please do raise your hand or put it in the chat and I will read it out. I've got a message saying that Flavia has is following, which is great. It's it's really good. Um, I have a raised hand from Julie. Um, and given that no one's saying anything, feel free to unmute yourself and then just ask, I think. Uh, no, that was a mistake, actually. Sorry. Okay, then. Um, given that nobody's saying anything, I'm going to assume that everyone is following. Oh, wait, no. 
I tried changing to Wi-Fi and got disconnected to the meeting multiple times. I see. Um, sorry to hear that, Zoya. Yeah, um, feel free to go over the meeting afterwards. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join. Um, yeah, as, as I said, it's, it sounds like it sounds like no one's got any problems. So I'm going to assume that everyone is is just having time with their life and has no questions and understands everything. So I'm going to move on. So in my, in my beginning slides, I briefly mentioned that there are four main things that we wanted to focus on when it actually came to visualizing our patients. Um, we wanted to do some, pa some patient demographics. We wanted to do some segmentation. We wanted to look at patient journeys and we wanted to do some risk certifications. Uh, these very nicely actually correspond to these sections here on the left. So the, the descriptive summary section is for just visualizing patient attributes in a reasonably simple way with just some simple bar charts. Uh, the segmentation section is, as you can probably assume, just about segmentation. The theoplots are a way of visualizing patient, patient activities and patient journeys, and the risk certification is just about risk certification. Uh, the main idea behind the descriptive summaries is to try and visualize the patients from different directions. So you can see that I've got seven sub tabs. We've got demographic overviews, which produces a population pyramid. I've got clinical characteristics, which focuses on multimorbidity. I've got activity overview, which then looks at costs and activities. Um, I, and then I also have deprivation, geography, and wider determinants, which are all fairly similar in that they provide bar charts of the highlighted topics. Some of these pages have some slightly different options. So if I go into demographics overview, I will see a population pyramid, um, probably fairly simple. I can hover over the graphs to see a little bit more detail about how many patients I have. I've got some more info on the right-hand side about how I can, um, about what exactly I can do with this page. But if I wanted to, I could try and segment this. I could already try and split these people into different groups. So let's suppose that I wanted to find a clinical condition. Let's use hypertension because I think that's a fairly common one. So if I select hypertension, the graph itself will update to slightly reshuffle the color scheme and it will tell me that it will show me the proportion of people who are without hypertension or with hypertension. I could recalibrate this to say, show me separate plots rather than or a single stacked one. And then I'll get two trees. I'll get people with hypertension and I'll get people without hypertension. So you can see that the people with hypertension uh, kind of peaks around the 74 to 75 age band. Um, and essentially the point is just that I can play around with the options to, to visualize my patients in, in different ways. Um, this one is obviously looking at population pyramids. If I go over to clinical characteristics, I get bar charts. I can, I have some options on what metric I want to visualize. So I can look at my population. I can look at the spend. I can look at the activity. And then I can split this by various metrics again. So if I wanted to look at, say, the total activity, um, you can see that I'm saying that the individuals that, I'm splitting my population to say that I have my multimorbidity on my x-axis, and then I'm saying, and then I'm comparing how the total activity changes depending on, on the number of long-term conditions that people have. If I look at something like activity per capita, I get a graph that I pretty much expected, which is that as the number of long-term conditions increases, I I get more activity. I could then try to segment this by say the males field that I added earlier. Um, if I wanted to compare how the um, how 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 that affects things, so I can see that in this bar, yeah. So I can, you can see that it's 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 now giving me different colors. You can see that here at the at multimorbidity seven, when someone's got seven long-term conditions, um, apparently uh, males have more activity than females, which is probably to do with the fact that I've actually got very, very few people. So if I double check on my patient count, you can see that I've got very, very few people in this group. So this probably isn't particularly representative just because I've got so few individuals. Uh, but once again, it's just an option of, I can visualize certain patient attributes in different ways. Um, I could look at the prevalence of particular um, clinical conditions in general. 
um, just seeing how many, just seeing what proportion of my population is affected. Um, and really, I, I could click through each of these pages, but deprivation, geography, and wider determinants all follow a very similar structure in that you essentially just select the metric that you want graphed, and then you just see, and then you just have some options for segmenting it. When it comes to wider determinants, you can also choose generally which wider determinant you want to see, which may be handy if you're doing some work around that. Um, but I've typically found that the index of multiple deprivation is actually quite good when it comes, it's quite good to just use instead of a particular wider determinant. The final page in descriptive summaries was essentially designed to try and just give as much flexibility as possible when it comes to plotting. So at the moment it's displaying nothing. Um, and that's because it's waiting for me to select what it is that I want to plot. So if I wanted to, I'm, I'm going to defer to a couple of fields that are at the very top of this list. So apologies if, if someone finds this boring. Uh, but essentially the idea here is that I can select any field that I want from my data. And then it'll plot, it'll segment it for me kind of as, as a bar chart in any way that I, in, 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 in a way that I can control. So if I wanted to view ethnicity by say, um, I'm going to say hypertension again, just because I like select using that field. Um, it'll plot, it'll create me a graph that uses the just these two fields. It'll tell me, it'll tell me exactly how the ethnicity distribution is within each of within four patients with or without hypertension. Um, the idea being is just that if, if there is a particular visualization that you wanted to see and that it's not included by default on any of the prior pages, then you can just come here and then you can play around a little bit with these options to just visualize it for yourself. Uh, really, this is just a simple way of segmenting the population according by any field that you may have in your data set. Uh, as usual, there are some options for just the for just separating the plots or generally just changing how it looks. Um, I could instead of stacking them, I could just look at the row count. Um, which is once again, just a different way of looking at things. So this has been the descriptive summary sections of the Explorer. Um, really it's just what the name suggests. So I'm going to pause for just a couple of minutes again to see if anyone has any pressing questions or wants a bit more info. Uh, once again, feel free to just either type it into chat or just raise your hand. Um, hello. Hello. Yeah, hi. Uh, I just wanted to know if there's an option to uh, correct the charts for um, uh, denominator, like uh, total population of like um, kind of corrected by the total population percentage. Um, I, I'm not sure I fully understand. So the uh, option is so, generally just that, so, I mean, on this page, if I look at it, it, it just tells me, um, relative to the total population, just what, okay, what yeah. like you might yeah. need to be a little bit more creative about, um, about doing some of the divisions yourself. Um, I don't think exactly what you are asking oh, for. Yeah. I actually, I, I missed the option of person. So, uh, what, uh, what value is it using? Can we know from which your what yeah. total population mm -hmm. values is it is using? I, I might not have I might not have explained this correctly, but each of these graphs is interactive. So if you hover over them, it will give you a bit it will give you a bit more in-depth information about what it's displaying. Mm -hmm. So here it's telling me that about 93% of hypertension patients are in the ethnicity white. And then if I just try to hover over this one, it will tell me that only 0.7% of these patients are in the mixed ethnicity. And then obviously I can try to, um, if I were to set this to count, I could once again hover it and see what the row numbers are. So you can see that the that, that's 1,077 patients um, in the white segment that I highlighted earlier as the majority. Does that help? Yes, no, I just wanted to know the, count of population so what's the denominator it's using the percentage of what can we see the uh, total it, values it, it's using uh so it's it's the percentage is of the total 7500 individuals that we selected at the start okay uh, 
So it's a proportion of these patients. Although in this particular bot, it's a proportion of all of the patients who are in this bar. So um, it, it, I suppose that to answer your question, it doesn't display the total per um, mm -hmm. bar. You would need to just rely a little bit on the x-axis to tell you. So you could see that this one yeah. down here is, is about 6,100 or 200. So this is going to be around 1,200. Yeah, like in the demographics overview, because I missed a lot of things because I was going in and out of the meeting. So I just wanted to check like if it is representative of the population from where this has been taken. And if you see like in the population, if there are more pro uh, working age adults, is this representative of that? I'm I'm not entirely sure I understand. Sorry, um, probably on my bad. Um, like pe people coming to this hospital might be in this age group, hence they are more uh, lying on the middle, thirty-five to thirty-nine. I just want to see if like, it is, yeah, yeah if so the population I, represents. Your question: um, All of the percentages in in this tool are reliant on the initial analysis data set that you select, which is this seven and a half thousand in this case um so you can't really that is it's a it's generally as a percentage of that as opposed to any other group um okay. there really isn't an option for including a separate so it's not okay it's not from the population of that city where this hospital is or it's no, not no, really okay. from the total that i've selected it's from this total analysis data set that i selected at the very start so everything is plotted from these individuals. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Um, does anyone else have any questions? I'm going to take that as a no and move on. So I am aware of the fact that I promised a break to everyone at 11 and it's currently 10 minutes to 11. So I'm going to, I think, get started with segmentation and then we're going to have our break a little bit later. Hopefully that's fine by everyone. So when we think about segmentation, I'm sure that everyone has their own impressions or thoughts about what they immediately mean by it. Uh, so we wanted to do a kind of mix of both, I suppose, traditional, but, but what we might call traditional or um, clinician-oriented segmenting and data-driven techniques for actually looking at the population. So when I say traditional or, or clinician-oriented, what I basically mean is that we already have some criteria that we know we're going to be using for our to do our segmentation. Whereas they, with data-driven techniques, we essentially just tell the program that we wanted to select it, it, that we wanted to use certain attributes to group our patients into distant clusters, um, and we basically just rely on that for um, for defining groups that are statistically significant um, in terms of a particular metric. So the first two options that we have here um, are long-term conditions by age and bridges to health. Um, these are our simpler options. And then decision trees and k-means clustering are our data-driven techniques. Cr chronic condition, um, kind of long-term conditions by age is, is, is a fairly simple segmentation. All we are basically saying is that I'm going to create a three by three matrix where I'm going to specify what the age limits are for each of them. And then I'm going to set, I'm going to define what my complexity is for each of them. So all I've really done here is that I've, the default options here are basically just um, zero to 17 year olds in the first column. Uh, then the second column are my adults and then my elderly are my third. I could change the, I could change these limits if I wanted to, um, to be something different. And I could also um, change the limits of my complexity, um, which at the moment are set as zero to one, two to three, and then four or more. This is the number of long-term conditions that it uses to actually define complexity sampled from a list that I can change from this drop down here. Um, 
so if I wanted to, if so if I wanted to, I could exclude certain conditions or I could only look at certain ones. And all this will really do is just give me a give me a simple plot of how many people fit into this um, particular group. So here I've got my low complexity um, children, which is pretty much what I would expect of. I've got some 1,200 individuals um, and they are reasonably cheap um, per head in terms of the spending that we do on them. Uh, I've, I've just had a question pop up from Omnia in chat. Is complexity essentially comorbidity? Yes. So in on this, but generally in the program, complexity and comor comorbidity or multimorbidity or, LT or LTCs are used interchangeably. All they refer to is the number of long-term conditions that uh, an individual has. Um, but I, I basically defined long-term conditions during my data loading so that my program, um, so that the explorer basically just aggregates from the long-term conditions that I told it to look at. Uh, but yeah, in a sense, I just use the same words. In, I just use those different words interchangeably. I do apologize if that causes any confusion. But essentially, this, base, this is basically just a relative plot to see how the costs vary um, as you move along either in age or complexity. So you can see that if as I move along the cost, if, if even if I just increase age, my costs increase, um, not necessarily the total cost, but the spend per person certainly does. And the same applies when I move towards high complexity. So that would be moving from top towards the bottom. Um, and the actual number of people um, also decreases. So we essentially end up with cohorts that are, or segments uh, that are smaller in, ter in terms of the number of individuals present in them, uh, but are of comparable spending, especially when you consider the spending per individual. Uh, in every single segmentation page, there are some options for essentially comparing these. So at the bottom of every single page, we have a tree map and a pie chart, which may or may not be um, the metric that you were looking for. But essentially, these are constant on all of on all four of these pages so that you've got a similar view in case you wanted to compare how different segmentation methods perform and, and how they plot things. You can look at either the number of individuals or the total cost or total activity um, just to see how well different segmentation methods this actually discriminate in terms of these metrics. So you can see that if I just change from number of individuals to the cost, then certain segments will get much larger. Whereas if I return to number of individuals, you can see that my smaller um, cohorts essentially just to vanish here and in into the bottom corner. The other um, kind of prescribed segmentation method that we've tried to inbuild is bridges to health, which um, is, is also a kind of predefined uh -huh. segmentation method that um, is available online. Just a moment. Sorry um, for the noise. Yeah, so Bridges Health is another kind of prescribed segmentation methods which has kind of pre-built segments um, that rely on clinician opinion rather than anything data-driven. You can see the definitions here on the right-hand side. Um, and then you can see the plot itself here. So at the moment, all this is doing is just, it's telling me that of my entire 7,500 patients, 2.43% are in the acute real segment, um, 20 eight are in the chronic condition segment. But then, if, but then if I wanted to, I could segment this um, plot by the various options that I have available. Um, so once again, I've got these variables that I could look at. I could try and create separate plots rather than just having all stacked one. I could look at the row count of the population. But essentially, there are just some options to play around with of, of how I want to visualize it. Uh, once again, I have the same tree map and pie chart towards the bottom of the page, uh, just in case I wanted to see how, what the relative sizes of, of the segments were for this population that different methods produced. Uh, this brings us to the data-driven section um, in the Explorer. 
for anyone who may not be familiar with decision trees, I think that the simplest way really is to just actually plot, um, is to just actually create a decision tree and then explain how it works. Um, or the, to, to just kind of give some other context, all I'm really simply doing is I'm going to select what attributes I'm going to let the decision tree use to actually build the tree. In this case, I'm going to select everything. Um, I am then going to select my target metric. Um, which is going to be total cost. Um, it's worth noting that you can't have the total the variable here on the left hand side be the target because that's just kind of pointless. Um, and then I'm just going to tell it to make me a tree where it will basically automatically segment the population according to its internal calculations. So basically what this does is it produces some population groups by splitting the population according to the average costs, and then it tries to make sure that these groups are as different from each other as possible. Um, and then it would basically construct fairly simple rules that are intuitive for a human to read, um, that hopefully are comparable to something like Bridges to Health, which was developed by clinicians over some time. So to explain what this has done, all it's saying is that it's got 7,500 patients at the top, and then it's going to split the population depending on whether individuals have repeat polypharmacy um, less than nine, um, which is just the number of um, prescription drugs that they are taking, or whether it's more than nine. And then the next step, it will once again do a split. This one isn't particularly clearly explained, but all it's really doing is it's looking at my bridges to health segmentations, and it's splitting them into two categories, and then it will, here on the left-hand side, it will split by repeat polypharmacy. Here it marks mental health quaff as, as a significant in this particular cohort, and then here on the right-hand side, it marks heart failure um, as significant. And, all it's, and basically what this has done is it's created for me one, two, three, four, five, six, seven segments, um, each with its own set of rules that apparently didn't quite like that. Sorry, just a moment while I load back in. That was unexpected. Um, sorry, just some technical difficulties. Please stand by for a moment. Uh, yeah, so as I was saying, all it really does is, is this basically creates this branching tree where at the very end of the tree, I've got my various population groups. It will tell me how much on average this group costs, what percentage of the population is in, in this group. And then, um, and then basically I can just use this to potentially select my, my segments of my population that are relatively healthy and inexpensive. And then compare them and then basically just select the individuals who are very expensive and then maybe I can do some further work on these individuals. The, the neat thing about the decision trees is that if you just go along the branches and you actually look at the definitions that it gives you, you can then separately come back to the same cohort of people later um, and maybe do some further investigation into why they're so expensive or what it is that's causing um, certain issues with them. As you can see, there are quite significant differences when it comes to the spend. So, so these groups here on the left side are much cheaper than if you compare it to this one. Uh, just to avoid any confusion, E plus 3 um, just um, is, is kind of standard notation for times 10 to the 3. So this would be 26,000 pounds. Um, and once again, I just have the same pie charts and tree maps towards the bottom that I could change. Uh, the one thing I haven't really mentioned up until now is that you can also use these segments in the, in the descriptive summaries if you wanted to. So I could just come in here, I could enter, say, cart as the, as the name of my segments. Um, it will then add it to my global groups. And then when I go back to, so just so if, so if I turn back to navigation, you can see that it's added it to this group. And then if I go into say, my generalized bar charts again, and I wanted to look at my um, new field, assuming that I can find it. 
I could then plot this by say ethnicity and then I could compare the um and then I could essentially just do some more work on seeing how deprivation or other inequalities may change in between uh the various segments so you can see that yeah essentially it's just a way of taking any segmentation that you do and then feeding it back into other parts of the program to, to try and do some, some more further work. Uh, I've had two more questions from Flavia in chat. Uh, so the seeds are set up automatically. Um, they are random, as in they are not set with each session. Um, is there, also, is there any way to see the ODR or the confusion matrix? Uh, I'm afraid that there are no ways for this section. Um, the rationale behind it is that um, essentially as part of our target audience, a lot of our expected users and, and really users are GPs who, uh, based on some impressions that we've had, are put off by if you put up, put too many numbers onto the screen. So we've tried to keep it as simple as possible, which is why we've basically just got the tree and the segments and, and that's about it. Hopefully that helps. The other, so just to finish up the segmentation real quick, and then we can all take a short break. The other, the, the other data-driven uh, segmentation methods is k-means clustering. Um, uh, essentially, all this all this does is it will, unlike decision trees, which create fairly simple definitions for the population for for what your actual segments look like, k-means all it really does is it asks you how many clusters you want to have. And then it is going to lump in every single field that you give it into creating really, really complicated high dimensional kind of segments that are essentially just an alternative to, to the three trees. But I've personally found them to be really hard to decipher when we actually talk about um, uh, when we try to actually take it back into descriptive summaries. And, and it's generally much harder to actually try and target a particular um segment um later with an intervention if if we are interested in doing some follow-up work um, yeah so that's about it for segmentation um i am going to pause here for five minutes just to give everyone a break um so um please be back here by 10 minutes past um, I, I do have one more question from Flavia. Um, how do you know that it is? Ooh, so I'm just jumping around. How do you know that you're not overfitting if you don't at least see the OOB error, or will the app give a warning or error? Um, the answer to that is that at the moment is that that we 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 don't really do any. Um, we we don't query the any overfitting or relevant metrics at the moment. Um, Feel free to include that in in a in a feedback session um, later um, if if it's if it's useful. Um, I just want to mention that my colleague Rich has now joined us. Um, that's for he's not here. Not here. Um, he he's been sitting kind of um, at 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 my side. So if you do have any questions about the more technical things, feel free to put them into chat, and I think he will be happy to answer. Um, just to double check, Rich, uh, we are going to be doing a survey at the, at the end, right? Yeah. yeah. So um, if anyone has any more feedback or, or recommendations of, of, on generally this, um, we will be sending out some communications after the session um, because we do have a survey that we would appreciate it if everyone could fill out. Um, so feel free to just respond to that with any more questions that you may have. Um, yeah, otherwise, a uh, five-minute break for everyone. Thank you.
So um, I think that was five minutes. If someone could confirm whether I'm visible and audible, that would be great. Um, I am brilliant. Um, yeah, so hopefully everyone should be back by now. Um, in particular, all I'm going to ask is whether Flavia is back. Um, so um, I, I've got some more info that I would like to say just in relation to the last question. So um, if Flavia is back, if you could just let me know so that I can answer again. That would be nice. Okay, so um, assume that people are back. I'm I'm probably going to just carry on. Um, hopefully, almost everyone has trickled back by now. Um, I did just want to jump back onto the last question um, where Flavia was asking about overfitting um, and other potential errors. So the one thing that I would like to emphasize is that um, when we talk about decision trees here, we are not using them for their descript for their actual predictions. All we are doing is we are trying to do a descriptive summary or, or, or a descriptive segmentation of the population that gives us some intuitive rules um, and, and the actual segments that we are interested in. Um, we're not looking to predict at all. So um, the all we're gonna all we're really looking is just back at the data. Um, so uh, the overfitting doesn't really matter in that case. Um, my program has turned itself off, which is a little awkward. How do I make this disappear? Okay, sorry. Um, my program has, has decided to turn itself off after five minutes. Um, yeah, so for anyone whose program turns off, um, you will probably still have this little red button here. All you will want to do is press it and then relaunch it. It should remember the, um, assuming that you created a nice data set, it should remember. Otherwise, just load back in. Um, I would say don't worry too much about clicking on anything that we did prior. It shouldn't matter. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to emphasize that the decision trees we are not using to predict. We are just using them purely as a descriptive tool. And because we are just using them to look back on the data, we are not using to predict anything. It doesn't really matter whether it overfits or, or, or kind of how accurate it is because we are still just gonna rely on actually taking the segments back into the descriptive summaries and then actually doing some more analysis of just looking at the at, at our, at our um, various segments and just seeing what they actually look like um, just to make sure that it is what we had in mind. Um, the risk certification segment, that's predictive, um, and I, I will talk about the, what we've done to mitigate overfitting there when we get to it, but first I'm going to talk about theoplots. So, um, hopefully you may have seen theoplots before. Um, basically, these are a patient level graph that just tells you, that just shows you the activity over time that an individual has had in terms of interactions with the system. So this particular individual you can see has had some primary care contacts in, 20, in between January 2020 and July, and has then had a secondary a and admission in 2021. Um, so once again, these are interactive graphs. And all it's really doing is that it's telling me is that it's going to, according to some criteria, it's going to pull a random individual from this population and is then going to plot their activity. Uh, so you can see that at the moment it sampled a 30 to 40 year old um, with no long-term conditions. So here on the left hand side, I can I can I have some flexibility around choosing what criteria I want to use to actually sample these patients. Um, the reason why we have to sample them rather than specifying them directly, um, so we can specify them directly by uploading potentially 
IDs, but due to information governance, um, we essentially have to make sure that almost everything is random. Uh, but regardless, if I wanted to, I could be a little bit creative about the attributes that I use. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to select patients who have six to eight long-term conditions, and then I'm going to plot one of them. Uh, the main reason why I'm doing this is that this will give me a graph that has a lot more points on it, which, which might be a little bit more interesting to look at. Uh, but essentially, the point is that if you can, if you have a particular small cohort that you're interested in, you can just kind of sample some people and you can see how they, they are interacting with the, with the general healthcare system. You can see where they've been active. Um, you can generally see if, you know, if, if they have a secondary appointment, do they have follow, do they have follow up community appointments, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there are a number of options, as I said, to kind of control how you filter. You can control the date range of when the graphs actually plot over. You can control exactly how, which activity types you want visualized. Um, so I, I could try and change this. And, and you also get a short little summary about the individual just to highlight, just to give some more wider information about what they're like and, and um, what their current health status is. So this is a single theo plot um, or an individual one. Um, for, for this particular page, the info is actually here um, on the, in this little box. The reason being is that we couldn't quite fit it onto the right. Um, we also have a group theo plot, which unlike the, the individual theo plot, you can actually ask, tell it how many individuals you want to sample. So I'm going to do what I did previously, which is I'm going to tell it that I wanted to sample people who have um, a lot of well, high multimorbidity. And I'm going to say that I just wanted to plot my secondary and my, say, mental health activity. Um, this then also lets me assign various colors so I could make my mental health green and my secondary black. And then when I tell it to plot, it is going to find me up to 20 individuals, assuming that there's 20 individuals who meet my sampling criteria. And then it is going to produce me a much bigger plot where instead of having activity along my y-axis, I just have my various patients. And then the idea, so the idea behind this is that if you, it, it just makes a comparison between, between patients a little bit more, uh, well, simple really. So the individual theo plots really are good for diving down into an individual patients, whereas a group theo plot, you can, Look at the, look at a lot more patients, and you can see whether they share particularly similar patterns. So you can see um, that when we talk about mental health, this individual has had some mental health appointments. This individual has had some, but otherwise, it seems that um, there are very very few mental health appointments, but there are plenty from secondary care, which is our which are our black points. Um, you can see that some people are healthier, whereas others are are more frequent, say, in A and E um, or non-active inpatient admissions. Um, really, theoplots are basically just a way of visualizing individual patient journeys, um, with the idea being is that you can use individual theoplots when you want to showcase a particular pathway that keeps happening up, and group theoplots is, would be what you might use to identify that particular pathway or sequence of events in the first place where you have, where you sample out your 20 or 50 individuals, and then you just actually look to see how um, particular events change. Um, so we're making fairly good time. So I'm going to pause again um, to see if anyone has any more questions about theoplots or theographs. I think I've, we've also had them called. Um, once again, feel free to either unmute yourself and just ask or to just put it in the chat. Okay, um, I'm not seeing any messages, so could someone please confirm that I haven't disconnected from the meeting um, and that everyone is still here? Uh, just for my personal benefit.
Anyone? Yeah, yeah no. Just, ooh, okay. Brilliant. Okay. No questions. I love it when there are no questions. Um, it means that everyone's following. Okay, so the we're making really good time. Um, we might actually be finishing earlier, so I think we'll have a lot more, I guess, question time at the end if someone has anything complicated that they want to go through. Um, the last section in the Explorer is risk stratification, uh, which was our attempt at creating a generalized linear, either logistic or regression model, depending on which, which way you try to use this page, um, towards actually predicting healthcare usage of our patients. So um, this page is a little bit complicated um, and it takes some uh, takes a little bit of getting used to, but basically the main idea is that you can you is that you try is that we try to use patient attributes um, which you can select from this list to predict either the probability of having activity or the expected cost or expected activity of a patient, um of particular activity types that you can select um with kind of the idea that you fit um you fit you fit regression models to the attributes to try and predict the activity and then we, we can just essentially just see which fields are um reasonably re essentially we can just see what the distribution is and how good of, of a model we can fit towards actually predicting um say A and E admissions. Um, there are a lot of options on this page. You can see that there's a, a lot of help text. Um, we have a lot of options for trying to mitigate overfitting. So um, as the user, you can control a lot of things. I'm not going to change any of these, but essentially you can control what your proportion of training and, and, and testing data is. You can you, you have some options for how you handle missing data, which um, maybe our systems have better data than we do, but we do often find that um, it is almost guaranteed that missing data NAS and NAs are going to slip in. Um, and we can we can also we can also choose to use AIC for optimizing the number of variables that we include in in our models. For anyone not familiar, AIC basically just look, tries to minimize the number of model, number of fields that we use in our in our model by basically saying is that if we've got a hundred fields, um, uh, so it, it kind of has a, has a two for purpose. It tries to it tries to reduce overfitting, and it basically just says is that if you've got a hundred fields, hundred patient attributes that I'm using to to plot. Um, to, 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 to build my model, and they give me some <laughs> accuracy. Uh, um, sorry, was it a question? Hello? Um, I just heard someone speaking. Was it a question aimed at me or not? I, I think that wasn't the question. So, yeah. Um, yes, I, I would like to ask everyone to mute if, if if they don't want to talk. But yeah, in short, AIC basically just makes sure, make sure that only the fields that have the most predictive power are included in the, in the model. Uh, the idea being is that if you've got 100 fields um, and they give 75% accuracy, and then you can get, say, 73% accuracy with just 20, then you would use the model that gives you your 72% accuracy because it's it's much simpler to fit to 20 than it is to fit to 100. Um, and potentially that 3% could be overfitting. It could be any number of things that you don't want occurring. So all I'm, re so I'm just going to run this. Um, all it's really going to do um, is that it's going to take all of these attributes that I've got selected, and then it's going to try and predict me the probability that my patients, that each pa that any patient will have any sort of activity whatsoever. Um, so all I'm really going to do is I'm literally going to click go without changing anything um, to try and get an example of how this works. Um, thankfully, the data that we're using is is reasonably small, um, which means that this runs fairly quickly. Um, but it does give us a lot of outputs that we can play around with. So the uh, essentially, um, this model consists of, of two steps, depending on what it is that you're trying to predict. For the probability of activity, it just runs a simple logistic regression. Um, if I wanted to predict 
actual activity count or activity costs, it would run a logistic regression, and then it would, after that, run a linear regression to actually try and predict only for the patients um, who we think are going to be having activity. The reason being is that we found that the model used to, um, essentially the model used to be, a, um, used to kind of just assign everyone active, it used to, um, essentially we just found that it, it's better to only predict for the patients that we think are going to have activity rather than for everyone, because otherwise the model tends to assign activity to patients, even those that, um, who wouldn't otherwise. Um, but essentially all this really does is that it, it takes, it takes every, it takes the individuals that we got in our data set. So, um, I think at the moment I'm, yeah, looking at my seven and a half thousand. It splits them into groups numbered one to 10, where one is considered least risk and 10 is most. And you can see that the probability of activity is, is given in each of these box plots here on the right. Um, and you can see that group one is, is basically expected to be fairly low risk. But as we move through the groups, we kind of expect people to kind of become more and more high risk. Uh, there are a number of summary kind of outputs on this page. Um, you could download the model if you wanted to look at the numbers in a bit more detail. Um, and at the very bottom, you can essentially, as usual, you can add this to your global variables. So if I wanted to, I could then once again go back to my descriptive summaries um, and I could say try to create create my different trees based on my risk group. So I could try to create a separate tree for each group um, just to see what it looks like. Um, I'm not sure if this is at all useful, uh, but you can see there are some clear differences um, in between various risk groups, in, in term, say in terms of patient demographics. Uh, but the overarching idea really is just that we try to fit a model towards predicting activity. Um, some, it still remains to be seen how much use this can actually be put into practice because we found that it's uh, kind of as a jack of all trades, it doesn't necessarily give the predicting accuracy that you were hoping to um to say predict um a and d ad admissions for the next week um it's, it's often better to just kind of have a separate model but at least as an introduction um I, I towards you know kind of the options that you can do i think that this is is reasonably good um yeah so i am once again i know that this is probably the most complicated um <laughs> page in the explorer so um, I'm going to pause and and kind of ask if anyone has any questions about this. Although, given that we're at the end, if you would like to ask about anything else, that is also fine. I'm aware that we're a little bit early, um, and I do have a couple more things about use cases that I would like to mention. But for the time being, does anyone have any questions about risk certification um, or really just the Explorer in general? Um, hi, I have a question. Um, and sorry, you may well have covered this, I missed it. Um, but just in terms of the data set that you'd put into the risk stratification part of the model, would that follow on typically from the segmentation? Like, would you select, would you sort of typically do it on a particular segment? I'm just one, wondering about the interaction between segmentation and risk so, stratification. Um, Really, um, I, I did try to briefly mention this, but the idea is, is that all of these pages, um, they don't follow on from one another. They just feed back. They all follow on from the initial analysis data set that I defined at the very start. Do you remember that? Yes. So the yeah. data and what I'm using is, is what I defined at the very start. It's this non-missing one. Now, if you wanted to, um, and if you did find a particular segment that you did want to use, um, what you would want to do is go back into the landing page. You would then want to create a new analysis data set that uses that segmentation um, to define a new analysis data set. And then you would kind of load back in and then jump onto the certification. So essentially the idea is that this analysis data set that we define at the start, we can't modify in, in during these pages we can only do it by going back to the start, defining a new one, and then kind of um, loading back in. 
the idea being is that we wanted the data set running behind every single one of these pages to be constant. Mm -hmm. um, okay, no, that, that makes sense. Thank you. I guess in a way, my question is maybe more of PHM1 rather than yeah. as if a model. It's like, how do those two sort of approaches sit together? Like, because they're, they're in a way two ways of um, segmenting the population. And I just wondered if you typically sort of build, you sort of find a segment and then you do risk stratification on that, or it's not, not as straightforward as that. And you might take different approaches based on your scenario, I guess. Um, I'm afraid that I don't really have, I haven't really actually, so I haven't done any kind of live risk stratification really. Um, typically people are happy to just walk away with any segmentation um, that, that they get. Um, I, I've not really had anyone actually asking for a certification um, really. I mean, this is just my personal experience. Maybe it's different for you. Um, but I've, I've not actually had to use it in this particular way, um, kind of where you follow up segmentation with certification. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. It's a great tool. Thank you. Um, I've Omnia has asked in the chat, is there a way to see the code used for logistic regression? Yes, it is up on the GitHub. Um, it should all be available for you to view. Um, but of you at your own risk, it's not particularly neat, but um, it will all be up there. Um, just, just, use, just refer to the same folder that I've uploaded to the um, to this positive cloud. So you remember the NHSR22 and then Explorer 2.5.2 folder. Uh, does anyone have, does anyone else have any questions? Um, yeah, sorry for, sorry for having to keep asking about questions, but um, we were supposed to run until 12 and it seems that we've gotten through, thing, through the content a little bit quicker than I anticipated. So uh, I'm just trying to pad the time out a little bit. Hello. Uh, I have, yeah, I have a question regarding the data set which was uploaded. So um, if you're using our data set and we don't have some of the activity types, like if you don't have data from primary care, for example, like is there an option to still use this tool? Yeah, so essentially um, the data, it's, so the data itself must be uploaded, but the actual content of the, of the file that you upload can just be dummy data that you create yourself. Um, so, the, so essentially, the, the way that the program is designed is that it has to it has to see the essential fields, you know, the the index of multiple. It has to see the deprivation and the efficacy of the field. But the actual content that you put into the field itself when you upload the data is completely up to you. So, um, if you so, my advice would be is that if you do want to use it, is is to just create some dummy data that that essentially goes into that field. Um, mm -hmm. And then yeah, it, so that it runs, yeah. It should run perfectly fine. Okay. Even if the data, I mean, it'll still load the data. It will just give you nonsensical numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but it's quite helpful. Like uh, the tool itself is quite helpful. Glad to hear that. Uh, do you have any other questions? Uh, no, not for me. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm gonna jump back to chat again. So I've had I've had two questions. The first of which is, how easy is it for us to add our own R code to this project? I use R but not Shiny. Um, say we want to add some things. Could you advise on how we could approach this? Um, yes. So essentially, the way that it's designed um, is that you can see that we you've essentially got a page here on the left hand side. So the general idea um, and kind of long term expansion that strategy that we would recommend is that you essentially just create a new page. Um, and then the this date, the data that we are using here um, can be refer, you, you essentially just you refer to the same data set from your page. But the idea is that I could just add in something brand new right under here, call it whatever I wanted. And then similarly to, uh, it's crashed again. Similarly to how all of these pages work, you could essentially just run it independently of the other pages. Um, if you would actually like to have a more in-depth conversation about this, 
Uh, I'm not sure if you have my email, but if not, I'm I'm happy to share, and then and then you can just write to me, and we can set up a meeting. Um, if if you if you would like um, a little bit more technical details on this, um, so please let me know um, what you think. And then I've had another question: Is it possible to get a sample of um, your MDS to see what you included? Uh, I'm not sure what MDS stands for. Hmm? Um, if, if it stands for uh, for a minimum data set, um, that is it also <laughs> it is up on our GitHub. Um, I have tried to emphasize this. Um, it should be right up there. Uh, so I, mean, I can I can double check. Yeah. So it's it's not in the NHSR files, but there is a um, folder for it on our GitHub. Um, I think it's called synth data or synthetic data or something like that. Thank you. Um, it is it is in the RDS format, which is kind of the R native format, but really converting from it to CSV or or or, or vice versa is really simple. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Thank you. No worries. Right. So I'm I'm hoping that if anyone has any more questions, then they'll they'll let me know. Um, the final things that I I wanted to mention. Um, assuming that I can jump back down to, to the end of this, um, is, is kind of the actual use cases that we've had in our system. Um, I, I didn't want to talk a lot about this, so I, I just thought I would mention two brief things. Um, so we've personally found that yeah, locally, wh whenever we, talk, we try to use the XRO, we basically found it to be useful for smaller projects. So something like someone has a question of how does um, pregnancy affect COVID-19 vaccine uptake, or what percentage of a particular PCN has hypertension? How is it distributed? How is it distributed in the population pyramid, et cetera? And basically the idea is that you can just really quickly load up the Explorer, um, assume that you've, you've got the data pre-formatted, um, it, it does remember, and then you just really quickly answer those two, three questions. So um, yeah, I was going to highlight that in the BNSSG here, we've used it to basically just answer of does 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 pregnancy affect COVID nineteen vaccination uptake? Um, I when we did the, we did some work around this, we essentially found um, that it doesn't really. What actually had an effect, what had the greatest effect, was our acute polypharmacy field that we have in our system wide data set, um, which was a little bit unexpected, but it had it seemed to really nicely split the. Um, population um, and uh, and yeah I mean that, that's that's basically kind of the local use it seems it's been, it's been for smaller side projects where someone just has a question and then we try to answer it as opposed to like a really expand like a really expensive deep data dive um, for for a really thorough and really complicated data dive I think that you will still need to refer to you know specialist analysts to actually pull the data and then format it as needed um, but it's really just for the more complicated things. Um, the other thing I was going to, to mention is that I had a meeting about two weeks ago with East Suffolk and North Essex um, NHS Foundation Trust, and they basically said that they were using it for, rather than really for a purpose that we made it for, they were actually using the Explorer with its with the data set that we've included um, to just do kind of some training and introduction to PHM for new incoming staff and generally just to spread kind of some information about what PHM looks like and, and what it could do. Um, so th that is about all I wanted to talk about today. I'm, I'm aware that we are 20 minutes ahead of schedule. Um, the GitHub link, I believe, has been shared. If not, it should be on the screen. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. The one final closing remark that I wanted to ask is um, if Chris, are you still around? Um, essentially, we wanted to ask everyone to do an anonymous survey. Unfortunately, um, we, we didn't quite manage to integrate it to be ready. So we were hoping to just send a, an email around afterwards. And I just wanted to ask Chris if he's still here, whether um, we could get everyone's emails or whether I needed to ask right now everyone to just put it into Zoom chat. Um, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I mean, I don't do the bookings, but I imagine Charlotte will have a list that we can contact people afterwards. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah. 
So um, I believe that that does conclude the workshop. Um, as I said, I'm 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 happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, thank you very much for coming. Um, I hope that. Well, I suppose even if you don't use the extraordinary and that you've at least learned or it's inspired you to do something similar. Um, yeah, thank you very much.